Chris was one of my, I say it all the time. Chris was one of my favorite people ever, not just in wrestling, like just as a person, like I was obviously close to him on the road. Um, but off the road, like he, I, I considered him as a brother as well. Like we were just like so close. And when he passed, it killed me because I literally was getting on a plane to go to California when I got that phone call and I was going to California for like two weeks and I wasn't able to come back and I missed his burial. And that always like hung over my head that I wasn't able to go and I, I said, I just hope that everybody realizes, like, because it was just, like, a sudden thing, I was working, you know what I mean? Like, I hope they, yeah, of course. Was, you know, she just didn't want to be there. Like, it killed me to get on that airplane that morning. No, I'm sure. And to be honest, like, as far, like, as far as, like, me and my family goes, there were so many people there that yeah. it was just a blur to me, to be honest. Like, very few things about that day and the following days that I even remember, you know? Sure. So it was, uh, you know, it, it, it sucked, but as far as who was there and who wasn't, I, I couldn't tell you cause I was just right. you know, up by the casket saying, you know, thank you. Hello. What's up to everybody. But, what is, what is the uh, years between you? How, how much older was Chris than you? 10 years. His birthday is going to be uh, uh, March 21st. He's coming up this month. Okay. So when he was trained, he started training like super young, right? Yeah. Yep. He was like what, 13 or something. When he like, got in the ring, <laughs> like thirteen, he started running shows in our town. <laughs> so it was even before that. Good <laughs> yeah, lord! Was, yeah, he. Uh, it's pretty crazy. When he was thirteen, you know, he was going to the Monster Factory. He was, uh, you know, we say our grandfather, but Popeye Chuck yeah. Richards isn't related to either one of us by blood. But it's a long story. But anyway, he was like, I want to have wrestling in Marucci Park in Spring Lake, and you know. Balls lives close by. Bam Bam lives close by. So long story short, he got like dressed up in a in a suit and a tie and a briefcase and went to a council meeting and like pitched this whole idea on why they should have wrestling in the park. Oh. And they gave him the go ahead. And then, uh, oh, you know, he started running shows there for I think it was like two summers. So they would, they would bring the ring from the Monster Factory. And it was like um, they would like send around a can and people would put money in it. And then that's what they did. So it was cool. And there's a whole bunch of newspaper articles and stuff that I found about it. And then Bam Bam, who had already been like wrestling a little bit, he would come. So the, you know, the newspapers would be out They'd be taking pictures with the little kids and stuff. So it was cool. That story just amazes me because he's, he's a baby himself and here he is running shows. At and you, like know what, 13. you know what else is insane that he did? So we're like, I don't know, maybe like 60, 60 miles from New York city when he was 13 him and his buddy Scott would say they were like Scott would say say he's sleeping at our house. Chris would say he's sleeping at Scott's house, and they would take a bus to Brooklyn and wrestle in these wrestling shows under this underneath this bar. It was called the Galaxium Bar or something. But he was like 13 years old taking a bus to Brooklyn to wrestle. Scott was um, Scott came in ECW. What was his gimmick in? No, I don't. I think we're thinking of a different Scott. This guy oh, it's not the same one town. that he brought no. in. Okay. Because I was gonna say, if it's the same guy, he was a little crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's because I'm doing something. Um, so you see your brother doing all this stuff. You're you're three years old. I mean, mm -hmm. you're a baby. When did you realize like you wanted to try and wrestle? Um, well, I mean, as far as I can remember, I always, you know, was like involved in the business. He was taking me with him, and I just figured I would just kind of fall into it one day. And that's kind of how it happened. Like from like how my wrestling started, I was like 19 and I lifted weights with my brother the whole time. And we, you know, messed around in the backyard and on the beach and everything. But uh, we get to the show in Rochester and he like looks around the locker room and he's like, I don't know any of these dudes. I'll just wrestle you for the main event. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, really? Is that cool? Like, he's like, yeah, yeah. Just, just do pretend it's the backyard and just, just listen to me. I'm like, all right. So if he hadn't been so damn good, I would have killed him. I was just like picking him up, tazplexing him, belly to belly, overhead suplexing him, just kicking the shit out of him. But when I, so that happened. And then I started like my first 15 or so matches or 15 to 20 matches were against him. So that's kind of how I, how I got into it. 
and I feel so bad for him in hindsight. Like when I first got started, I did a run. It was, he was working the Sandman at the Amazura Center in Jamaica, Queens. And Sandman's like, hey, kid, I'm going to get you involved. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm, he's like, I'm going to go. He's like, he's like, he's like, you slide in, get the cane, go like you're going to hit me and then turn and, and cane Chris, me and you do beers and then I'll cane you. I'm like, all right. So sad man was like, uh, oh no, my brother was like, Johnny, when you swing the cane, don't swing it like a baseball bat, swing it like over, over. the top and, and crack me on the head. I'm like, all right. So I get in there, you know, going to hit Sandman. And in the excitement, I just swung it like a baseball bat, whacked Chris right in the face. <laughs> and he had like a black and blue stripe like across his eyes, right? So the whole ride home, he's like, oh dude, you did so good. That was amazing. I'm like, oh man. So the next <laughs> night I cut a promo it was going to be like a pull apart. So I, I had wanted to, to be a professional boxer. I've been training that way. And he's like, you're going to get your brain scrambled. So I'm like, all right, I'll do wrestling. So I did the promo. He comes out, he gets in my face in the ring. He shoves me. And I just go boom, boom, boom. I, I hit him with a left, right. So I blacked his left eye, his right eye. And then I punched him in the side and he fell on the ground. Oh, so he was God. like laying there before the guys even, even came out to pull us apart again on the ride home. He's like, that was so good, bro. That was so good. Fast forward to <laughs> not his- good. <laughs> I know. So fast forward to his house, and we're having a couple of drinks. And I'm like, dude, give me a black eye. I'm like, you have two black eyes. Give me a black eye. He's like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm like, give me a black eye. Come on, come on, come on. I kept like, like needling him to give me a black eye. After like a half hour, he's like, I'm not gonna give you a black eye. And he like, like whacked me right in the eye. And I fell off the bar stool. <laughs> so me and him both had black eyes. And, and then we came to my mom the next day, and she's like. She's like, look, look at the moron brothers. What did you two do last night? <laughs> so. Well, you, you said something that uh, I remember well. Work. Everybody asked who, who's your favorite to work with. And I have a lot of people that I loved working with. Chris is always at the top of my list because Chris was never the type of person to sit down and go over every single step in the ring. Like, he would always say, oh, Francine, I'll just call your name and tell you to give me a chair or tell you that. I didn't have to remember much with Chris. And it was just like working on the fly. Like he liked to call things out in the ring. It was very easy like to work with. So when you just said, oh, we'll just go out there and we'll just whatever. And I'll talk to you. That's how Chris worked. Um, You know, nothing against people who like to go over every single step. But he was so just, I don't want to say nonchalant, but it, it was more like of a easygoing vibe working with Chris. Like my nerves weren't as bad. Because it was just like he just wanted to call things out there and he would just tell you what he needed. It was very yeah. easy. I was going to say, just because, you know, he loved wrestling so much and that's like all he ever cared to do. That was what he was so good at. Like, he loved everything from the, the ride there to being in the locker room to in the ring. Yeah. And like, I, I can almost like, when I was younger, I, I was a pitcher on, on a baseball team. And the only way I can kind of like, think of it is always just I couldn't wait to get to the field I couldn't wait to pitch I couldn't wait to like and like times that by 10 and that was that was my brother but like as far as wrestling goes my first couple matches I did want to call everything because I was nervous you know and then you know like he later on I'm like hey dude you know maybe this is like 10 15 matches in I'm like we'll do this gimmick you know where I whip you into the turnbuckle he's like he's like I'm not calling anything he's like you know it finishes a sunset flip just keep your ears open and then, like, my last couple of matches, I guess he just made it a point, but he just, like, ran me ragged. And I remember after it was, like, a, like we did, like, two nights in a row of, like, half-hour, 45-minute matches, and I just barfed after both of them. Oh, wow. Because he was just trying to show me, like, how, you know, there's levels to this, you know? So you, you worked at – obviously, you worked after he passed. Did you keep that train of thought, like, I, you know, I'm going to work with my brother, I'm going to call things out there? I think I think it more depended on who I was working with. Yeah. Like again, if, okay. it, was, if it was balls, we knew each other so well. <laughs> but man, I would kick the shit out of him because he was, he would be like, like for instance, we had that cage match I was telling you about. He was he was like writing shit in notebook, like finishes for like a week before, and we were doing a whole bunch of stuff off the top of the cage, and then uh, like I, I remember getting to the building that day. He's selling his gimmicks, so I can't go over and talk to him. He'd like, you know, go into the bathroom real quick. I'm like, dude, you want to talk about what we're going to do? He's like, not now. I'm selling my things. Not now. I'm just like, oh, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. And then finally, <laughs> finally, when we got 
he, right before our match, he's like, he's like, all right, here's what we're gonna do. Boom, boom, boom. He's like, you're gonna miss a swanton through a table. Um, I'm gonna chair shot you, duct tape you to a table, climb up the cage and jump off and give you a leg drop. And I just remember like laying on the table, duct taped, like looking up, seeing his ass like crawl up the cage, and then like close my eyes, just being like, all right, pretend you're not even here, and then boom, boom, and. The people at the show were like, oh, they like gasped. His mom like ran to the front. She's like, John, you killed him. This is so they took me out on a stretcher and everything. But long story long, it uh, <laughs> it, it depended on who I worked with. Yeah, As you're lucky I, he didn't set you on fire because he'd like to do that to some people. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. He was very fond of the the kerosene and the fire. Um, your book, what? made you decide to write about your brother how long in the making is this because i i honestly didn't even know you were doing it until i saw it on twitter and i was like oh wow he's writing a book or he wrote a book yeah yeah so maybe in like 2010 i started um i started writing a book and so i started at the end like you know the the days leading up to his funeral and all the crazy shit that happened after and then um you know i worked up and I, let's say i got like 130 pages in and I read it back and me and him were together like every day, especially the last like three years of his life. So I read it back. I'm like, man, this doesn't even scratch the surface. I'm like, fuck. So I, I put it away. And then John Cosper just finished doing Tracy Smothers book. And Tracy Smothers is like, you have to do a book on Chris Candido. So then John Cosper called me and he's like interviewing me for the book. And I'm like, I'm like, I have a book that I started writing. Can I email it to you? He said, yes. And then he read through it. He's like, this is really awesome stuff. Huh. Like, can I use it and make you co-author? I'm like, absolutely. And I'm like, I have a bazillion pictures too. So I, you know, scanned them over like a hundred something pictures, told him, you know, sent him my book. And then, you know, every day I would like pass someplace and I'd be like, oh shit, that's the time that, you know, me and Chris saw this old lady shovel in her driveway. So we did it for her. And I would like tell him stories like every day. So it was hard to like pick and choose which stories went into the book, but um, it came out really well. I'm really stoked. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to read it. Um, did you like? Did you contact people for stories? Like, is Tammy involved at all, or did you? No, I mean, me and her are, you know, you don't. Okay, so but so I mean, she's in there like for parts, but as sure. far as like stories, like Dreamers, Dreamer got interviewed, Jim Cornette got interviewed, Doctor Tom, okay, um, Dan Severin, a, a whole bunch of people. You know, even like like new, you know, younger guys like Brian Myers, um, guys who like were coming up and, you know, my brother was, he didn't care. He was cool to everybody. Yeah. So that, like, that like meant a lot to a lot of like younger guys who felt like, you know, the guys who were older than them were kind of like, you know, not like kind of like being dicks and acting like they were too cool. And my brother, you know, Chris would just, you know, talk and hang with anyone. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a who's who of people that got interviewed, which is really cool. Nice. Well, I'm I'm super excited to uh to read this book because, like I said, I saw I saw you were on Twitter. I saw there was a book, and I was just like, "Wow, finally, somebody is paying homage to him." Because I I always say he is he's so underappreciated in this business. I think he would have been a great ECW heavyweight champion. I think Paul definitely should have given him a run with that belt because him and Shane, we could have feuded and did so much more um, than I, I think anyway, because I think Chris was the perfect package. I honestly do. And I've said that from day one, like he had, he could do everything. And the, the most endearing quality was his personality. And I just, I loved him so much. I still do. When I say my prayers at night, I always, you can, and this is no BS. I include him and Louis Spicoli all the time because oh. they, I loved those two dearly. Um, so I'm just so happy that somebody is finally putting Chris over in a good light. Um, Cause the boys always talk about him great. You know what I mean? But I, I just feel like as a worker, I don't think he was pushed the way he should have been. I think he could have did so much more. You agree, Chad? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We talk about him basically every uh, every few weeks that we're either watching something that he, he's in or, you know, he just was he was so good. And I, and I think about, you know, right before he passed that uh, what he was about to do in TNA, like where that was going to go. I mean, that could have been a whole reinvention of where he was going to be headed in the next couple of years of his career. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. They have that in the book too. Cause they were talking to the guy, I think his name's Andy Douglas, the guy from the natural. Yes. Yep. And they, and they, 
he, he got interviewed for the book and, you know, they said they had the whole next like year planned out. And then, you know, Chris passing kind of threw a, threw a wrench in their, in their plans. But, you know, even cooler than like how good he was in the ring and how much he, uh, you know, it was admired by the guys. He just, him as a person, he was just so amazing. Like, you know, what I think about, like when he was messed up those days, you know, really sucked. But what I really think of is when he got clean and when, you know, he lived a couple towns over and he would just have all my friends over all the time. He was like a big brother, like the whole neighborhood. And he was just always so cool and like, you know, never met a stranger. And, you know, was just a really awesome guy. So, um, you know, and, and like there are a lot of the stories in the book, a lot of them, you know, most of them from wrestling, a lot of them are from, you know, just like, uh, you know, being around town and normal you know, life. I, I, I can tell you about it. I mean, I'm from Jersey. So, you know, and you just did a uh, an interview with my uh, my partner in the two man power trip, John. You know, oh, yeah. we, we used to go to the NWS shows all the time. So we'd see you. We'd see Chris. You know, my but my one of my other buddies went to the same gym as Chris. Chris would be giving him advice on uh, on lifting him in the wall. They were they were there all the time. Yeah, Bradley Beach. Yeah, yeah the it was unbelievable the connections, especially in that Jersey Shore area. That you know, everybody has a, a Chris Candido story if you grew up in that area as a wrestling fan. Yeah, uh, you want to hear a funny story about Barry's Bar? Uh, I'm sorry about <laughs> about uh, Bradley Beach. So there was a bar down the street called Barry's, right? And uh, so going back. Chris benched 500 pounds when he was 19 and I was when when he was in Smoky Mountain there was this dude named Bruiser Bedlam and he was like his he had like a (laughs) yeah yeah he had like a 700 pound bench and he's like hey kid he's like uh if you're a three plate guy don't even talk to me if you're a four plate guy you can get me a cold drink if you're a five plate guy we can hang out (laughs) I, I remember thinking like you know I'm gonna be a five plate guy so fast forward I'm 20 and there's five plates on the on the bench it's 495 and I'm like, I get it up and I'm like, I rack it. I'm like, I'm like, guys, put a five on either side. I want to make it 505. So, you know, I'm a five play guy. So boom, I hit it for a double freaking stoked. We go over like, let's go to Barry's and celebrate. So we go to Barry's. We have like a shot and a beer. Chris wasn't really a big drinker, but he's like a little tipsy. He's like, Hey, bartender, check out my little brother, man. Check him out. Bench 500 pounds. Only 20 years old. Only 20 years old. Bench 500 pounds. The, the bartender's winking at him, like, how old is he? He's like, he's 20 years old. Look at the size of him. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, Balls was there going, two, two. He's like, Mr. Wrestling number two? What, what does he have to do with anything? Oh, God. And then, <laughs> and we're like kicking the chairs. Like, what are you kicking my chair for? And we're like, dude, the drinking age is fucking 21. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's 22. Like, that, it, just, it just took him like an uncomfortable amount of time to realize. What, uh, what he was doing, you know? It was funny best. though. He's That's the awesome. best. Oh God. Well, uh, where where can we find um your book? How can people buy it? I got one right here in my car. He said get pulled He's over. Selling there. them hot out of his trunk <laughs> of the car. Um, you can get them from my car. No, you can get them at um eatsleepwrestle.com. That's John Cosper's website. That's if you want a signed one by me and John, or you can just go to Amazon and search Chris Candido. No gimmicks needed. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Where can people find you? Um, do you want to give your Twitter out or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you could, my Twitter is mostly like wrestling stuff. I, I did it to, you know, to preserve Chris's memory. It's Candido 118, C A N D I D O 118. Awesome. Well, Johnny, it was great to see you again. I wish you a ton of success in life generally, but uh, of course with the book as well. Uh, I look forward to getting my copy and um, I'll let you know what I think of it. I'm sure I'm going to love it, but um, you know, your brother was, he's here. He's always going to be here for me. So um, it's it's nice to hear you tell the stories and I love seeing pictures that you post and um, it's just seeing him as a little kid just brings a smile to my face. So um, you made me smile. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, yeah, thanks so much. And the book's been, it's been received so awesome. And I'm so stoked that it's been, you know, it was on like the top. It's been in that, when it was a new release, it was between like one and four for the first month. And now it's been, it was like on the top wrestling books. It was, it's been as high as number seven. Today was okay. one, but it's like, it's, it's getting received very well. Awesome. So I'm really happy about that. Well, congratulations. Much Thank success you. to you. And uh, maybe I'll see you down the line somewhere. Sounds good.